Thank you all so much for uh, coming out to this beautiful uh, vegan festival. Let's give a big hand to the organizers of this festival. <laughs> Wonderful to, uh, to be here and to celebrate uh, a movement that's growing very rapidly, that's focused on compassion and uh, mercy, liberation, and uh, healing our, our society at a deep level. Behind me, you're going to be seeing some paintings uh, by Ma my wonderful wife, Madeline. This is Madeline. Let's give her a hand. She's from Switzerland. And um, we, we're traveling, as our friend Phil said, uh, on a, right now on a lecture tour to 14 countries in Europe. And we're very fortunate, as, as we heard earlier, I'm the author of a book called The World Peace Diet, which has been translated into 16 languages. And so we travel worldwide, and we can say, like Ken, actually, also. Um, but we've been, we've been to many countries all over Asia, Africa, and North and South America, and so forth. And seeing vegan uh, movement, the vegan movement, vegan restaurants, vegan uh, meetup groups, uh, vegan uh, sanctuaries and uh, coaching classes and so forth, just growing everywhere. And uh, The World Peace Diet essentially is a book that's about, not just about the vegan movement, but it's about understanding our culture at a deep level. And so actually, how many of you have actually read The World Peace Diet? Have any of you, one, two, just a few have read this. So we're hoping by in, in a year from now that we'll have a Greek translation also of The World Peace Diet. We have a good friend who's working on that. And I think um, uh, we're, we're really working on getting The World Peace Diet into uh, about 30 languages. And, and it's coming, coming along. So, but the basic idea in The World Peace Diet is to understand something that most people don't understand. I never understood this. And that is that we're all born into a culture that's organized. Am I going too fast or is, how's this, is this okay? Yes. You can understand, I don't wanna, I have a lot to say <laughs> and uh, not, not, not too much time. But, but the, um, the basic idea is we're born into a culture that's organized at its core around owning animals as property for food. That's called herding animals. And that this orientation of herding animals. We don't see it that much because most of the animals now, the cows, pigs, chickens, uh, and other animals are stuck away in stinking sheds where they never see the light of day their whole lives until they're taken out and killed. But that system of herding animals is the living core of our culture and all of us are eating the foods of this culture. So the basic idea is to see that what this is doing is not in our best interest. It's devastating on every level, on our, to our physical health, to our environmental health, to our psychological health, and to our cultural health, to our spiritual health. And the good news is that we are in the middle of a uh, evolution, a, a transformation of our society to another level away from animal agriculture. And I think if you're in this room, you're already aware, probably in many uh, ways, of the devastating impacts of animal agriculture on animals, on ecosystems, on wildlife, and, and on our health. But good news is that there's a, a, a major shift happening, and I think it's very important for us to understand the deep structure, the, the underlying idea. So in my own case, um, I was born in a typical family in uh, Concord, Massachusetts, near Boston, back in the 1950s. And one of the main ideas in the World Peace Diet that has to do with this is the idea of community, that all of us are products of our communities and living in a herding society, we're eating meat, dairy products, and eggs from the time we're little kids. So that was me. I ate a lot of meat, dairy products, and eggs my entire life. When I was about seven years old, I asked my mother, I said, Mom, the kind of food we're eating, is this what everybody eats? And my mother said, yes, this is what everybody eats. And I said, everybody in the whole world? She said, yeah, pretty much everybody in the whole world, they eat like us. This is pretty much normal human food. So um, she left, and then she came back a few minutes later, and she said, well, I'm sorry, that's not completely true. There are vegetarians. And I had never heard that word in my life, and I was at that age when I liked learning new words, especially if they were big words. And so I said, what's a vegetarian? And she said, a vegetarian, hmm. You know, I wouldn't worry about it because you're never going to meet one. <laughs> and then she said, I, you know, I'm, never, I'm a lot older than you are, and I never met one. 
And she said, I don't know where they get their protein. So I had this image of these poor vegetarians sort of dragging themselves through the dirt, begging for some spare protein, having no energy. These poor, and I was so glad I wasn't a vegetarian. I thought, all oh, these poor vegetarians, they're really terrible to be a vegetarian. And my mother was totally right. I never heard the word again. That was the end of it. And when I was about 13 years old, I went away to a, a summer camp in Vermont. It was this beautiful mountains of, of, of Vermont, these little hills, and there was little, a little farm there. I would go there in the summers, and I learned how to do things on the farm, and, and I learned, one of the things I learned was how to catch a chicken, how to hold her down with one hand uh, on this board with two nails in it, put her neck through the nails, and then with my other hand, I had my ax, and I would cut her head off and put her through the scalding tank, and we would eat our chickens. You know, I was 13 years old, and I had no problem doing that because at 13 years old, I had gone through 13 years of the most intense indoctrination a human being can go through. I knew at that point, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I was eating not just foods of animal origin, but I was eating attitudes, right? I was eating a whole narrative, a whole story. I knew God gave us these animals to eat. They don't have a soul. They taste good. If you don't eat them, you will definitely die within 24 hours of a protein deficiency. So you just have to eat these animals. That's their purpose. God gave us these animals to eat. This is the way it is. So I was happy to do that. I was happy to kill. I didn't like doing it. I mean, I, didn't, I never liked killing animals, but I thought if I don't kill them, I'm going to die. So we have to do that. That's how it is. And a little bit later, there was a few dairy cows on this farm. And the cow, she was only about four and a half or five years old. But we gathered around, and I helped. And we had a gun, and we put it right to her head, and we pulled the trigger, and we killed the cow right on the floor of the barn. And we, and we cut her head off, and we... You know, and we ate the cow, right? I mean, we, we ended up doing that. And, and the fellow who owned the whole thing, he said, you have to do that. You have to, if you can't get milk out of them, then you use them for meat. That's their purpose. Their purpose is to use them for food. We need the meat for their protein. We need the milk for the calcium. And if you can, and when they're on any dairy, organic or not, I guess you all know this, but when a cow, even though cows would normally live to be 25 or 30 years old, when they reach four or five years old, they're worn out and they're killed. And all their babies are typically, three out of four of their babies are killed. One, they'll, they'll keep one to be a slave on the dairy, but the other three are killed either right away or after a few months for veal. So I was 13 years old. I saw all that. I participated in it. And um, I, I just went on my went on the way but that's the main thing to remember this remember this point the very key point is when we leave this beautiful vegan festival we go out into Athens we go out into the world wherever we're living and we see people going into restaurants and going into supermarkets and buying the flesh of animals the secretions of animals there's only one reason anyone does that does anyone know what that one reason is there's only one reason anyone does that the one reason is pe the people do that is they're following orders. They're just doing what they've been told to do by very well-meaning, loving, kind people who wanted them to be, ha to be strong and have plenty of protein. And from the time we're little infants, you go to any grocery store and look at the baby food jars. There's turkey and veal and chicken and beef and cheese right in the little baby food jars. So we're eating that from the time we're little kids. And we're not just eating the food, we're eating the whole story that we have to eat these foods. So people get up in the morning, they don't think, gosh, you know, I want to get up and I want to make a chicken suffer today, or I want to make a pig really hurt, so I'm going to go buy some meat. They never think that. They think, gosh, I, gotta, you know, I have to get to the office, I need to buy something for lunch, so I'll just stop it and pick up some food, right? So people are not evil or trying to cause suffering. We're just all hypnotized. We're all programmed in a system that's been going on for about 10,000 years of owning animals as property for food. And we can see today that it's completely obsolete. It's devastating on every level, but we keep doing it because it's culturally injected into us without our permission. And so we can look at these beautiful paintings by Madeline, we can see the animals and we can see and we can feel within ourselves that we don't want to cause them harm and we can see that when we see fruits and vegetables and grains and nuts and seeds, that these are the foods that we're designed for, but the cultural programming is very powerful. So there's two main powers in the world. The two main powers, number one, 
is the power of the individual. That's us, right? Each one of us, if you're looking at me through your eyes, you are an individual and you have the power to choose your own food and to choose your own life, to live your life. It's a very temporary life. We're only on this earth for a few years. We have to be careful not to waste it. It's very easy to waste. It's very easy to become a consumer and just... We turn around and we're, you know, I'm, I'm 65 years old. I mean, I just remember just yesterday I was only 25. <laughs> the years go by very quickly. I, I read the other day that they uh, talked to the oldest living woman. And they said, what's it like? She's 118 years old. They said, what's it like to be 118 years old? She said, gosh, it went by very quickly. <laughs> so our life is precious. It's a temporary to live our individual life. That is so important. Uh, so that's number one, the power of the individual. Each one of us can choose. But the other power is the power of community. All of us are indoctrinated by our communities. We become a part of our communities. And the hardest thing, I think, about going vegan is it's what s- someone asked earlier, well, what about my friends? You know, what about my family? You know, they won't like it if I don't eat the food that they're eating. So that's the, the hardest part. We're, we're, we want to be like everybody else. We want to conform and get along and be like everybody else. So that's the hardest part. But the thing that happened to me, which I think is happening to all of us, when I was uh, right about 22 years old, I just turned 22, I, I graduated from college and I decided with my brother that we would go to California. And so we went on this kind of a spiritual pilgrimage. We tried to walk all the way to California. Uh, it was a long way. We didn't actually ever make it. Uh, we got as far as Buffalo, <laughs> which um, was, you know, and then we, then we headed south. But anyway, uh, after a few months of walking, we ended up f- discovering a community of 900 people. It was a hippie commune. Have you ever heard of a hippie commune? Well, this was back in 1975. There were hippie communes. There was a few. <laughs> anyway, we ended up visiting this hippie commune, 900 people, from, mainly from California, And they were all vegetarians, 900 vegetarians. And so we went there, and and these people actually were doing great. I mean, they were, we we today would call them vegans in the sense that they didn't eat any meat, they didn't eat any dairy, they didn't eat any eggs. And um, the thing was, no one in 1975 ever heard of the word vegan. That was not a word anyone heard of. So they said, well, we're vegetarians. And uh, they were doing fantastic. Nobody was dragging themselves through the dirt, saying, help, I need some protein. (laughs) They were really healthy. And they had 200 children, 200 kids that were vegan from birth, and they were all thriving. They were doing great. So I said, why are you guys vegetarians? And they said, there's two main reasons. One is, do you know that most of the food that we're growing Instead of feeding it to hungry people, we're feeding it to these imprisoned cows and pigs and chickens. And it's so wasteful that we have millions of people starving. And food shortages are the main cause of war and conflict in the world. And we want to try to create a world of peace, of harmony, of where where no one is hungry. So we're eating lower on the food chain so there's enough for everyone to eat. And I thought that was such a noble, beautiful idea. I thought, why doesn't everybody know about this? Why doesn't everyone say, yeah, I care about other hungry people. I'm going to eat lower in the food chain so there's enough for everyone to eat. Because every year, this is true today, every year, every year we grow enough food to feed 10 billion people. No one argues that. Every expert knows that's true. We have 7.5 billion people now. We still grow enough to feed 10 billion. We still have almost 1 billion people going hungry. Why is that? Because... Most of the food, 80, over 50, you know, probably 60 to 70% of the actual grains, the corn and soy and other things, we're feeding to animals while people go hungry. And this is well understood to cause a terrible suffering and, and conflict. So that's number one reason. The second reason uh, was they said, do you know what these animals go through? And I said, no, I don't want to hear about it. Don't tell me. <laughs> but they told me. And I think some of you are aware of it, but they just described a little bit the routine mutilations that cows and pigs and chickens endure, having their beaks chopped off, their tails docked, their ears clipped, being castrated without anesthesia, being branded, uh, being raped on rape racks, having their babies killed. I mean, being hyper-confined where they can't even turn around their entire lives, banging their heads against the bars, being driven into insanity. And we're, we're, you know, I heard about that and I just thought, 
wow, that, that's so horrible. And the beautiful thing was, at the same time, I was in a community where every single day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we would eat together. What would we eat? Meals of vegetables and grains, right? No meat, no dairy, no eggs. So that was it. From that day in 1975, when that guy talked to me, I have never eaten meat in my life. That was it. That was, so everybody clap. Yay, that was great. 1975. <laughs> I'm so happy, you know, really. I, uh, and what I, what I discovered um, many years later when I met Madeline, where's Madeline? You're here somewhere, I know. She, um, she's the, the artist back here. She also, in 1975, decided never to eat meat again in her life, and, uh, even though she was in Switzerland. And a few years later, in 1980, so that was 38 years ago, uh, I became a vegan. And uh, when I learned a little bit more and, and finally made that change uh, and became a vegan. And then a few years after that, in um, 1984, uh, I shaved my head and became a Zen Buddhist monk. So I found myself, I went to Korea, South Korea, and I was living in this Buddhist monastery, a Zen Buddhist monastery, and I realized I was in this community of, of people who had been practicing veganism for 800 years. And so I realized that veganism is not a new hippie idea, brand new California thing. It's an ancient wisdom tradition that goes back hundreds of years. And I would say it probably goes back thousands of years. I think one of the main roots, actually, of veganism is Greece. Greece is one of the probably three main roots of veganism in the world. I think India, China, and Greece are the three roots of veganism on our planet in terms of uh, philosophers and people living a life in, based on vegan living. So uh, in my case, it was China in Korea. Uh, people realized hundreds of years ago that if we're really serious about living a life of liberation, uh, about spiritually awakening, about creating a culture of peace and harmony and freedom, we cannot be eating animals. We cannot be imprisoning animals. And so, so this um, monastery in South Korea, for, for 800 years, there was no meat, no dairy, no eggs, no wool, no silk, no leather, no fur, not even killing mosquitoes, right? You would just kind of take them outside. <laughs> and so I realized that this is the teaching of ahimsa. Do you know, anyone know what ahimsa means, that word, ahimsa? Yeah, non-violence or non-harmfulness. The basic teaching in, in all the world religions, actually, the ancient wisdom teaching is if we want to be happy ourselves, then don't cause, don't be violent. Don't abuse others, don't imprison them, don't harm them. And so we live in, so the thing to understand is we've all been born into a culture where Every single day, we imprison and abuse and destroy the happiness of millions of beings. Every day. That's what we're doing as a society. And cows and pigs and chickens and fishes, these animals, their interests, each one of them, their interests are to them as important to them as my interests are to me. So we just have this idea that we're superior and, and that their suffering doesn't matter. How would we like it if a superior species came along and thought we tasted good? and didn't care about our interests, and, and no matter what. I mean, they just saw us as matter. Can you think, of, I mean, think about this. We look at these beings, we look at cows, pigs, and chicks, we're taught to look at these beings as merely matter, just flesh. We, we see a, a cow as, as burgers, we see a, a pig as just uh, ham, we see fishes as just flesh, chickens, uh, cows as just uh, milk. I mean, if we were looked at that way ourselves, that we're just flesh. This is pure materialism. There's nothing more violent than to, to look with eyes that don't see a being. They just see a thing, a, com a commodity that we can buy and sell and kill that is just our property that has no value, that has no meaning, no purpose, no significance. What we do is so insidious and evil and violent, and yet it's, it's basically, um, we, we act as if it's normal and natural. And, our children, and all of us as children are forced to take on this set of attitudes of materialism, of seeing beings as just objects that we use and kill because they have no purpose at all. So if, if a superior species did that to us, I, you know, I might say, well, wait a minute. I mean, don't you understand? I mean, I can play the piano. Doesn't that matter? 
or, or I, I can write poetry, or I mean, I'm good at playing tennis, or you know, whatever. They say, it doesn't matter, I'm just going to kill you and eat you, so it doesn't, none of that matters. That's what we do to these animals. They're, how many of you, have, have any of you ever been to a sanctuary uh, where animals, anybody? Well, yeah, some of you have. Well, Madeline and I have been to sanctuaries all over the world where animals have been somehow uh, freed from uh, factory farms or backyard farms, and they're living uh, without a purpose, without being killed. And you go to any of these places, and there's two things you'll learn, actually. One is that every single animal, whether it's a cow, pig, chicken, or any goose, or, or, or um, sheep, or goat, they all have personalities, they all have their unique tr character traits, they all have their interests. And the thing is that we, when, we, when we actually experience this, we realize that all of us have been wounded. We, the, being born into a culture where we're forced to participate in and witness all around us beings reduced to just matter and killed. And then we don't just do that because when we take out our wallets, we have to remember, you know, this is what actually does it. When I take out my wallet and these, these euros, those are ballots. That's voting to make something happen. And they all get counted. Every euro gets counted. Every euro, if I pay for meat, dairy products, or eggs, when I do that, somewhere an animal gets stabbed, somewhere an animal gets raped, somewhere an animal gets abused because of me. I'm paying for that. But we don't just pay for it. We turn around and then we eat it. We feed it to our children. So we're causing the suffering and then we're eating the misery. And this, these animal foods concentrate not just the, the physical toxins like heavy metals, PCBs, dioxins, nuclear radiation, all kinds of herbicide, pesticide, fungicide residues, I mean, the, the amount of physical toxins at these foods is the reason cancer rates are going up and heart disease and diabetes and all these problems go up, but they concentrate the other toxins, like we're eating terror and fear and pain and anxiety and despair and misery and panic. We're eating these, these, these states of mind, these hormones, these realities that are very real, and we eat that and we feed that to our little kids. And we wonder why we have a society where instead of using our money and our resources to create beauty and to feed everyone, we have a tiny wealthy elite that enslaves everyone. Because the thing is, if we're exploiting animals, we're going to be exploited. We can't expect anything else. As we sow, so shall we reap. That's the way it works. So we have to realize, if we're going to eat meat and dairy, we're always going to create a society of injustice and violence. Pythagoras told us that. He said, as long as human beings eat animals, there's going to be conflict and war. And I used to teach um, <coughs> college courses in, uh, in, in Plato's Republic. And, and Socrates talks about this very clearly. He says, if we're going to eat meat, we're going to have to go to war, aren't we? And they, uh, and they say, yeah, we'll have to go to war. In fact, I talk about this in the World Peace Diet. When we look at our society... Basically, 10,000 years ago, there was a revolution. It happened actually in what is today Iraq, and sort of in the, in the eastern Mediterranean region. For the very first time, people started eating, excuse me, people started to own animals as property for food. They started to own wild sheep, then wild goats, and about 2,000 years later, wild cows, and then other animals. And this was the last revolution our society ever experienced. That was a revolution that changed everything. And it did about five things. Number one, when people started owning animals as property for food, they reduced them. So animals became merely commodities. They're just objects. They're just things like rocks. So animals were reduced from being mysterious and powerful and respected to being just objects. And not just the pigs and cows and, and goats and sheep. All the animals were reduced because even the animals like the bears and the lions and so forth, they were also now our enemies because they might somehow interfere with our property. They might kill our property. And, and so that was number one. Animals were reduced. Number two was that these animals were wealth. The more animals you owned, the wealthier you were. And so we had uh, the arising of a wealthy elite class. This wealthy class 
of powerful men. And why were they wealthy and powerful? There had never been this, this, this had never happened before on planet Earth, to have a wealthy elite class that was basically dominating everybody else. But that was this new class that arose with animal agriculture. It was a wealthy elite capitalist class. The word, the ancient Latin word, you probably all know this, the late ancient Latin word capita means head, right? Head, as in head of sheep and goats and cows. So this wealthy elite class of, of proto-capitalists, basically, owned the, 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 the wealth, which was livestock, animals. And I used to teach college courses in the ancient Greek tragedies and the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Iliad, the Odyssey, and these ancient writings, the ancient Old Testament. You just read that. These, these are the writings that came about 3,000 years ago. And by then, it, it's all happening, right? You have the kings. The kings are always uh, uh, eating meat. And they're the ones that own all the, the livestock, most of the cows and, and other animals. And then they invented two new institutions which had never been on planet Earth before. Number one was war. There had never been war before. Once you own animals as property and you have a wealthy elite class, it's the same thing as happens today, right? How do the, what, why do we have war? When the rich want to get richer, they go to war. So that's what happened. It, when they would go to war, and so a king would see another king that had a lot of capital, a lot of head of sheep and goats and cows, and he would attack to get all those animals to increase his wealth. They would, they would fight back, so we had the first large-scale wars. And like I said, this is the, 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 the ancient word gavia that means war is the desire for more cows. So they, they created war, and then what came out of war was slavery. There had never been slavery on planet Earth, but it's a small step from enslaving animals that, to then enslaving uh, each other, other human beings, owning them as property and so forth. So this, war, uh, this society based on war and slavery emerged in the Eastern Mediterranean. Two other things. One was women status also was uh, destroyed because women were seen as mere breeders. Like, what animal agriculture is, is two things. One is it's seeing animals... Uh, as objects to be used and killed for food. The other thing is you see animals as mere, merely objects to use sexually because you need to get more animals. So the more, um, the more you can impregnate the females, the more money you make, the more babies you have, the more wealth you have. And so the males started seeing the females as just objects to be used sexually to give offspring. And so women's status declined. We had the whole destruction uh, in many ways, of the status of women. And then boys also, now they're the role model of little boys to, to emulate, to try to be like, was the role model of a hard, tough, disconnected male. Someone capable of violence against animals and against women and against rival herders. And so this culture that emerged in the Eastern Mediterranean, a uh, very warlike and violent patriarchal society spread into the northern Mediterranean, you know, came here, spread from, from the northern Mediterranean into Central Asia, spread from there into Europe, spread from Europe to North and South America, and, and basically all over the world. We're born into that culture today. That's the culture we're born into. It's still the same culture. And uh, I, I refer to this, um, this whole thing today uh, this, is a hard, this is a big mouthful, but I refer to it as the military, industrial, meat, medical, pharmaceutical, media, banking complex. It's, <laughs> it's this huge complex, and uh, it all works very well together. When you have people eating animal foods, then you have a war machine, then you have sick people, then you have a huge uh, medical, pharmaceutical complex, you have a large banks and media conglomerate that just encourages this. And uh, I, I understand this very well. I was born into a media company. My father owned a whole chain of newspapers. And I learned early on growing up that you never print any news that the advertisers won't like. So we have to understand when we're watching TV or getting news, it's the news from the corporations and the big banks. That's, the, the, what's, that's what they want us to think. So it's very important for us and understand our culture, that we're born into a herding culture based on war and violence and abuse of animals and other people and ecosystems. That's what herding, that's what animal agriculture is. It's reducing beings to things. So going vegan, when we understand what going vegan is, going vegan isn't just a marketing thing. It's, it's not just a shallow thing. Going, actually moving, changing our life so that we are, for ethical reasons, 
no longer participating in violence towards animals, that is the greatest gift we can give the world. There is no greater gift we can give to animals, to human beings, to future generations, to ecosystems, than to move to a plant-based way of eating and living for ethical reasons. When we do that, we're going right to the root of the actual spinning fury at the core of our culture that's causing endless violence and abuse. And if we, as human beings, do not go vegan, if we don't move, if we don't wake up and stop abusing animals, we will not have a world for our children. We under, I think we understand that. There's no way we will not destroy this planet. Because when you have seven and a half billion people eating animal foods, and the violence and abuse and insanity of that, we won't, we won't, we won't. We will go extinct, and we won't even know why it happened. So we have to understand that what the vegan movement represents is our only hope for the future. It is the only hope for our future. And it's a, but it's a beautiful hope because it's our true nature. And that's the beautiful thing, is that one of the things to really remember and really feel deeply and understand clearly is this, which the, the basic idea is that all of us, all human beings, have been given this wonderful gift. We've been given the gift of a physical body that does not require any animal to suffer to get all the nutrients that we need to be healthy and to celebrate our lives on this beautiful earth. We've been, all been given that gift. The thing is, we've also all been born into a culture where from the time we were born, we were uh, compelled to participate in these mealtime rituals where uh, we had to eat the flesh of animals. And so this wonderful gift was suppressed and we, were, we ended up refusing the gift. We said we're going to stab and kill animals anyway and cause them terror and pain and suffering. And when we do that, we not only, not only harm them, we harm ourselves. So that's the basic situation. I'll, I just want to maybe say two more, make two more main points, and then I'll, if I have time, we can open it up for a few questions. And then um, we do have uh, a workshop kind of situation following this for at least a little while in the other building where I can go more deeply into some of these ideas. The World Peace Diet audio book is me reading the book. It's 13 and a half hours long. So <laughs> there's an enormous amount of information I would love to share with you. And uh, I can just kind of give some of the main points. But I just want to make this other, other main point, uh, which is that we are, when we're eating animal foods, you have to understand that that meals are very powerful rituals. Anthropologists understand this. Anthropologists understand that every society transmits its values from generation to generation through the language and primarily through the rituals of that society. And the primary ritual in every society are meals. When people sit down and eating food, we're not just eating food, we're eating a whole set of attitudes about our relationship with each other, with animals, with nature, with the whole cosmos. So looking deeply into our meals is really the greatest adventure of self-discovery anyone can go on. It's how we really discover about ourselves because we don't just live in a culture, that culture lives inside of us. It lives in us as our language, as our habits, our attitudes. And so if we can shine light on that, but we're taught never to shine light on that. We're taught not to look at this. So I want to shine a little bit of light on what are the attitudes we're eating when we're eating the, the food we're taught to eat, when we're eating meat, dairy products, and eggs. What are some of the attitudes? There's many attitudes. I'm going to just mention f maybe four. I'll mention four attitudes. Number one, we're eating an attitude of disconnectedness. It's very important to understand this. The subtext of every meal is don't make the connection. You're just eating cheese. We're just eating bacon. <laughs> we're just eating you know, whatever it is. And we don't, we, we're taught very, very powerfully to not think deeply about where that came from. We don't, think, we don't eat the bacon and say, gosh, this bacon, yeah, it's pretty good. I wonder what the pig was like. I wonder what kind of life she had. I wonder if, you know, how she was taken care of. If anyone did that, everybody would get very upset. Right? We're taught, don't, do, don't ever do that. Just stay shallow. Don't look deeply, don't feel deeply, don't care deeply. Just trust the authorities, do what you're told to do. That's the basic message, is to don't make the connection. And this is ritualized. This is ritualized three times a day. It's, we eat it. It becomes the very cells of our body. This is incredibly deep. That's why it's so hard for people to go vegan, because they've been eating this attitude of disconnectedness, and it fills every cell of their body. But... What is disconnectedness? What actually is that? You know, 
I, I have a PhD in education from the University of California, Berkeley. One of the basic things you understand in understanding education is intelligence. What is intelligence? Intelligence is the capacity to make connections. That's it. That's what it is. Intelligence is the capacity to make relevant connections. So if we have a ritual which teaches every single one of us as an individual and the entire society at the same time don't make connections, what's it doing? It's reducing our intelligence. We live in a very low intelligent society. I mean, it's obvious. We, we, what do we do with our energy and our resources? We destroy each other. I mean, our intelligence is so reduced because of animal agriculture. It reduces our intelligence, not only our cognitive intelligence, but also our affective intelligence, the ability of compassion and empathy. Because every meal is teaching us, don't care. It's just a thing. It's just an object. Don't think deeply. Don't make the connection. This, this is the most devastating thing. So one of the things that happens when we go vegan is our intelligence comes back. We start to make connections. And then we start to make changes in the world. We start to ask questions. <laughs> we start to cause trouble. <laughs> we start to actually create a positive future. I mean, how are we going to create a positive future if we keep doing the same thing when it's destroying everything? We have to evolve. We're called to evolve. If we evolve, doesn't mean evolve means changing. I've heard people say, "Gosh, I can't wait to, to transform my life." And I say, yeah, "Great. Do you, you want to change?" No, I don't want to change, but I want to transform my life. <laughs> and we have to understand that this this capacity to make connections is so essential. That's number one. Number two, the attitude with every meal is that we're eating is commodification. What does that mean, commodification? What that means is to, turn, to see a being, not as a being, but as a thing. Every meal is teaching us to, to lose our natural human vision and adopt an artificial vision, a fake vision, where in, when we see a pig, we just see ham. When we see a fish, we just see dinner. We don't see a being, we see a thing. We, so what veganism is essentially, it's just... It's just coming home to our heart. It's coming home to our true nature. It's nothing to be proud of. It's not being better than anybody. It's just returning home to our natural vision. And when we see a being, we see a being. And we naturally feel a sense of respect and kindness and wish her well, wish, wish that she has a great life, send her love. That's our natural human state. That's our true nature, which is shut down by this society that we're raised in it's, it's, it's not anybody's fault. It's just come through the generations, and we're born into it. The third one is the mentality of might makes right, that basic mentality of, of elitism and privilege and the strong dominate the weak, that basic mentality. Every meal we're eating, what's the subtext? of every, What's the subtext? The basic message is those who are more powerful dominate and exploit the, those who are weaker. There's some people are inherently, or some beings are inherently privileged. Some beings are inherently better than others. And so the better ones abuse the less good ones. That's what we're eating with every meal. So how are we ever going to create a society of justice and equality when every meal is teaching us the opposite of that and we're all eating it? Why do we have such a problem with racism and sexism and all these other uh, injustices? It's because of animal agriculture, because we're eating this. We have, to, we have to understand this. At a deep level, our society is conditioned for violence and injustice because of the food we're eating. And then the fourth one is the domination of the feminine, the domination of the sacred feminine. We have to, again, I mentioned this earlier, but animal agriculture is not just killing animals. It's also impregnating animals against their will over and over again on rape, what the industry calls rape racks. All the animals, chickens, turkeys, pigs, geese, ducks, sheep, goats, they're all put on rape racks and they're sexually abused. You know, against their will, they're impregnated and they get the sperm from some male animals that are sexually abused to get the sperm and they're raped. And then, and then after they give birth to their baby, on every animal agriculture operation, whether it's a big factory farm or it's, a, or it's a little backyard operation. They're all the same. They're all the same. Little backyard operation, whatever. That's not your baby. I own you. I own your baby. I steal your baby. I kill your baby, and I rape you again. And I steal your baby again, and I kill the baby, and I do it again, and I kill the baby again, and then I kill you. That's what it is. It's rape and kill over and over, and eat it. 
eating this, right? Giving it to our kids. Why don't we see that? Why don't we talk about this? How, how is it possible that we live in a society where this is... How do we tolerate this, really? So the basic thing is to understand that we've all been wounded by this, and, and shutting down the sacred feminine dimension in men and women is probably the worst wound, because I, 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 in the World Peace Study, I have a whole chapter devoted to Sophia. And um, Sophia, as you all know, means wisdom, and this is feminine, because this feminine wisdom is in women especially. It's the wisdom of a mother when she gives birth to a baby to love and protect and nurture that little baby. This wisdom of the bond between the mother and the, and the child. But men also have this wisdom, the wisdom to love and protect life. But animal agriculture requires human beings to shut down Sophia, to block it, to just kill, destroy, rape, steal, and abuse. That's what animal agriculture teaches us at a deep level, to shut down Sophia. So when Sophia is shut down, then the wealthy elite class, man, nothing's going to stop them. Right? We'll, we'll destroy the rainforest at an acre per second. We'll overfish the oceans, destroy that. We'll create products for our children uh, based on violence and pornography and just uh, you put everybody in a system of slavery. Sophia would never stand for that. Sophia is the energy that loves life, that loves our children, that loves nature. Sophia is rising up to protect life. That's what veganism is. It's the resurrection of Sophia. It's the resurrection of the sacred feminine. The main thing to understand is that our, our bond, the bond between the mother and her, and her child, is really the most sacred thing. And we all know that. And I think if there's anything, we all know in our bones, if there's anything we shouldn't damage, it's that precious bond between the mother and her offspring, her little baby, her, her child. But animal agriculture is based on one thing, is you break that bond, you kill that baby, you steal that baby, so this is what we're doing. This is the great shame at the core of human culture today. We're so ashamed of ourselves because of what we're doing that we don't want to think about it. We don't want to talk about it. So that's why if I walk into a room and I say I'm a vegan, everybody says, oh, I don't like you. <laughs> because, because, you know, deep down, we all, we all feel guilty about this. I mean, really, we should. I mean, a healthy sense of guilt is a good thing. If, if people don't feel guilt at the violence, then, you know, that's just sociopathic insanity. So the thing to understand is we've all been wounded, and so now we can understand the situation. We can understand this 10,000-year history. We can understand how we've been wounded. We can understand how other people have been wounded. We can understand that in many ways there's no enemies. We've, just, we've all been abused by 10,000 years of violence that we've inherited, and now we've been given the gift of a human life. We have a gift of our life and every morning we can get up and we can say, okay, this is fantastic. I got another day. I can do something to help. I can do something. I can change my own life and I can share these ideas with others in a, in a loving and respectful way and do it creatively. And that's what I see happening. I mean, we've only been here a couple of days in Athens, but we were on that beautiful march yesterday. We're at this beautiful uh, event you have here today and hearing about the... Um, the, the rapid increase in vegan restaurants and just the rising of the aware, the raising of the awareness here. Uh, this is a beautiful thing, and we can all contribute to that. We can find our unique way, our unique. What, what can we uniquely contribute? Maybe we can do some videos. Maybe we can uh, give some cooking classes. Maybe we can talk to our friends. Uh, maybe we can, uh, like Madeline, you know, create some, some paintings. There's so many things we can do. There's so many things that need to be done. We can be a coach. You know, we have actually a, a training where we help people um, figure out what they can do. You know, have you, how many of you have seen, Kip, uh, have seen Cowspiracy or What the Health? Some of you? Yeah. So that's a beautiful example. You know, Kip Anderson, who created those films, he went through our training uh, probably about seven or eight years ago. And he told me, well, I want to make some videos about, about the World Peace Diet. And I said, great. And so, you know, so we, together, you know, he, he, did, he did the work, but, you know, I... I advised him. But the basic thing is to understand is that all of us can find something we can do. We can tell our own story. We can find a way to, to spread this message uh, in our own unique way. And I think all of us, as we do that, we create a community uh, of healing. That's what we're doing. So I just, I'll just end with that idea of community. That the basic idea, like, like I said, the only reason I was able to change 
was because of the community that I discovered at the farm, and then also Sangwangsa in South Korea, these two vegan communities I lived in. The only reason I ate meat all those years was because of the community I was raised in, my parents and my teachers and my doctor and everybody. They were all eating meat, so I did too. But then I saw these other communities and I was able to change. So right now, we're in a community that's vegan, right this minute, you know, we're in this vegan uh, festival. This is a community that's vegan, it's only for a day, but it's powerful. People come here, they understand that there's another way of living, they learn about great vegan foods, and they can change their lives. And so we can be part of this in a positive, loving way. We can create alternative communities. We can contribute to these online communities, meetup groups, sanctuaries, restaurants, all kinds of things. It's really up to us to create this. It's never been done before. I don't know how we're going to do it, but I think we, you know, we're called, each one of us, to contribute to this. And so I love you all. I so appreciate all the efforts that you're making. Never doubt that any effort is ever lost. It all helps. It all is part of the transformation. So I just want to just encourage everyone to know that we are part of an awakening. We're kind of in the, you know, the, the, the pioneers of this. But in the next five years, next 10 years, we're going to see huge changes happening. And more and more people are going to wake up out of this hypnotic trance of violence and realize this is ridiculous. Why am I doing this? And as they do that, we can welcome them. We can say, come on in. You can be part of this beautiful family, this beautiful movement that is going to transform uh, our world. And it's definitely possible. That's the really good news. The, that's the last thing I'll just end with, which is so beautiful to realize that we live, how many of you have noticed at some point in your life that our earth is beautiful? Anyone notice that yet? The earth is beautiful, anybody? How many of you never raise your hands no matter what? <laughs> I mean, if you haven't noticed the earth is beautiful yet, you live in Greece, my God. Anyway, the earth is beautiful. But not only is the earth beautiful, the earth is abundant. It can easily feed all of us. It's like Gandhi said, there's enough for everyone's need, but there'll never be enough for everyone's greed. Now, animal agriculture is greed. There's enough to feed everyone. So the beautiful news is we can feed everyone on this planet on a fraction of the land, on a fraction of the water, on a fraction of the petroleum and resources and pollution. We can allow huge amounts of land to go back to being forest and habitat again. We can allow the goats and sheep and cows and pigs and chickens to live their lives out in nature naturally. We don't have, there's plenty of land for everybody, and we can feed everyone. There's absolutely, that's the beautiful vision. That's the, that's the doorway. That's the, the beckoning door we can go through. We can feed everyone and be healthy. I'm now, I'm, I'm a vegan for, for 38 years. I have not been to a doctor in 38 years. I, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. My mother went, um, went vegan, I guess it was about 15, you know, 15 years ago. She's now 90 years old. She's the, the only vegan in her retirement community, and she's the only one who's not on pharmaceutical medication. <laughs> and the, the general thing is, you know, as, when we eat a healthy plant-based diet, organic whole food plant-based diet, we're going to be much healthier. And it's just a beautiful thing to see. It's really, as, we, as we're loving and kind to others and let them have their health, we find we get healthier. And it works. I mean, this is, this is well understood. So, uh, again, I, much love to you all. Thanks for the efforts you're making, and I look forward to working together in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> it's now about... Okay. Okay, so I think we have just a few minutes for uh, a few questions, and then we'll adjourn to the, um, to the uh, workshop space, which is just through the blue doors. But you can also ask questions in Greek, and uh, our wonderful Ellie will translate that, and then I can respond. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, I mentioned earlier my wife, Madeline. Let's give Madeline a hand again. She's right here. I, uh, I always say um, the smartest... <laughs> The smartest thing I ever did in my life was going vegan. I, well, the second smartest thing I did in my life was going vegan. The first smartest thing was marrying Madeline. But the second smartest thing was, was going vegan. Um, it's really a smart thing to do. Okay, yeah, go ahead. I, have a, I see your hand there. Yeah. Oh, wait. No, you don't have your hand up. You're just like this. Okay. Any, who has their hand up? Anybody have a question? One question. There we go. Yes. Uh, what do you say to people who live in areas of the world that are, uh, you know, grow any crops or vegetables and stuff like that, and getting those kind of things for food is very, very expensive, like a lot of indigenous peoples that are in northern places in the world. What do you, yeah. How do you view their way of life 
and uh, you see that their version of sustaining or living on the earth with their philosophies is problematic or, you know, okay. you see that. So the question was, um, what do I think about people that live in certain areas of the world where it's extremely hard to grow any crops, like people in the far north, maybe like you know, people in the Inuit, the Eskimos, or people living in deserts maybe, where you just can't grow anything. What should they do? All they can do is maybe kill seals or get meat. So basically, um, my feeling is that that's, that's a very small percentage of people that live in extreme climates like that. It's, you know, I'm not sure, maybe a few percent of the human population. I don't make a big thing about that. I mean, if, they, if, if they're in those situations and that's all they can do, then I'm not going to in interfere with that. But basically, you know, nine, over 90, 95 percent of the human beings, we can definitely eat food that we can grow and, um, and be healthy. And uh, the small percentage of people that live in such extreme places, you know, I mean, it's very small. And so I wouldn't criticize them for that. However, of course, the thing is, and I've been to Alaska, for example, where there's vegan restaurants in Alaska, and, and I've seen the Eskimos who are living on Coca-Cola and donuts and things that are shipped up there. And um, so basically food is shipped everywhere nowadays. And um, the other thing is there's people living in places where I don't know if people should be living there, actually, in the sense that like in, when I go to Switzerland, there's all these people living way the heck up in the mountains um, that are like using, doing dairy. Uh, and that's the only way they can survive is by doing dairy. In the United States, there's nobody living in those mountains. Those are all national parks. Everybody goes there to go skiing or hiking or whatever. Nobody lives up there. So I think you know, we, can, we can just um, develop our, our compassion for animals and not live in places where we have to you know, kill them and so forth. I don't think it's uh, necessary to live in those places. But that's a tiny minority, a tiny, tiny minority. But it's a great question. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. I'm not in any way supportive of being violent towards uh, animals yeah. or the abusive way people have. But a lot of animals are carnivores and they treat, due to their superiority, okay. uh, other animals like that. You can even say that years, a thousand years before, before we made our weapons, we were consumed by animals. Isn't that true? Okay, so the question is, uh, what about animals that eat meat and eat other animals? And uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, basically, in the World Peace Diet, I have um, a chapter called Some Objections Answered. And quite honestly, there's about five or maybe 10 main objections that people have. These are two of them that people sometimes bring up. Uh, and, you know, animals eat other animals, so we should eat other animals too. It's sort of implied, or, you know, that's, that makes it sort of this idea that. You know, I want to be like a lion. I'd rather be like a lion than be like a rabbit, you know. <laughs> so I think, you know, the basic idea is to see, first of all, I mean, we can look at our physiology. Uh, we do not have the physiology of carnivores. We definitely do not have a physiology of a carnivore. We definitely do not have a physiology of, a, of eating uh, dairy products. We're not little calves. We don't have renin. We have no way to digest casein, which is the main protein in, in uh, milk. Um, we do not have the natural blood lust. I don't think any little kids or even adults don't see little squirrels or little animals running around and just have this in, in, urge to just rip them apart and, you know, and have the blood, hot blood in our mouths and so forth. This is not who we are. So um, there are certain animals that eat other animals, the, the so-called top carnivores. They're a relatively small percentage of the population. Most of the animals are herbivores, like us. And um, so... Those animals are eating other animals, and that, but that's no reason, that has, no, that has nothing to do with us, basically. It has nothing to do with us. I mean, if, if those animals are eating other animals, uh, that's, that's what they're doing, but that's, that's, they have a physiology that's designed for that, and they fit into the ecosystem in that way. But people sometimes think that that's somehow we should do it, even though that's the only thing. And it's, it's actually very funny when you think about it. I mean, when you think about a lot of these animals will actually eat their own babies, right? If they, or eat the babies of somebody else. And you don't see some guy coming home and say, well, sorry, honey, you know, I ate the baby because, you know, some animals do that. And I thought, you know, 
they're carnivores, I'm a carnivore, I should eat my baby. <laughs> you know, we don't, we, we don't do that, right? Or we don't see, you know, some, very often, quite a few uh, carnivores, one of the most romantic things you can do is you eat some food, some meat, and then you go back to your partner, and then you vomit it up for her, right? You don't see men go doing that. <laughs> well, animals do that, I thought I'd do that too. You don't see people going up and living in trees because, you know, animals go up and live in trees. I mean, we're the only ones that are, you know, using computers and all this stuff. And why? But there's this one thing you know, that animals do, we say, well, we should do it because they do it. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. And yet, we, we, it's like we have to have some kind of a rationalization to justify abusing animals. And so we say, well, I, you know, lions do it. So, and I have, I mean, people say, I have canines, like these tiny little microscopic, ridiculous teeth that we have that are not canines at all. If you look at our physiology, I have a whole chapter on this. I mean, our mouth, the shape of our mouth is flat. We have very soft teeth. They would break right off if we tried to bite through our tough hide or bite into any kind of a bone. We have saliva that only does one thing. It breaks down carbohydrates. Uh, we have a digestive system that does absolutely not work well at all for animal protein. It's very weak, acid. We have a long digestive tract that gets all clogged up. And we, we have a circulatory system that gets clogged up by animal uh, protein and animal fat. So we can eat animal foods, but it's destructive for us. And think of this. Think of this one thing. This is very important. Do you know that cows right now on planet Earth eat huge amounts of meat? They do. They eat, especially fish meal. You know, scientists discovered a long time ago that if you enrich the feed of dairy cows and beef cows with fish meal, and they also mix in slaughterhouse waste, so they, they mix in you know, chicken meat and, and pig meat, that's stuff that's not used for, for humans, that feed it to cows. And they'll feed it to all these other animals. So do you think cows are designed to eat meat? No. Anybody? No. Are cows designed to eat fish? Have you seen any cows jumping into streams trying to catch fish? Cows are eating enormous quantities of fish. Why are they eating the fish? Why are they eating meat? Why are cows eating meat? Think about it. I mean, if these cows are doing, you know, if after maybe 20 generations living in a factory farm eating meat over and over again, one cow's going to say to the little, the little kid's going, why are we eating this meat anyway? And the, and the, the grandfather will say to the little, oh, be, be, we always eat meat. This is what we do. You know? <laughs> but why are they eating this meat? There's only one reason they're eating it, it's because they're being exploited. They're eating the meat because it makes them fat, makes them give more milk. It's, just because, it's not because the farmer loves them that they're feeding them meat. They're not designed, cows are designed for grass. We don't feed, we feed them very little, we feed them a little grass, but mostly we feed them a lot of corn and soy, which is very rich. It's too rich for them. It gives them E. coli, it makes them very sick, but it makes them give more milk and it fattens them up. But they don't stop there, they feed them meat. It makes them even fatter and makes them give them even more milk. But it's because they're being exploited. So the same, that's the same thing. If we're eating meat, we're eating the story, the rationalization, oh, we're meat eaters like the animals, but it's because we're being exploited. Because when we're eating meat, we're not going to ask questions. We're going to easily believe the official stories. We're going to take the drugs. We're going to get the uh, operations uh, and have our chests cut open and get a heart... <laughs> whatever it is, all these different things people have to have. I mean, it's, so, it's been so wonderful. I feel so grateful that I haven't, I haven't been to a drugstore in 40 years. <laughs> all these things people need, like Viagra and, 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 and whatever it is. I mean, aspirin, Tylenol, all these things. You know, we don't, we, we're not designed to need anything. We're healthy. We're naturally healthy. We shouldn't go to, we need to go to a drugstore or get any drugs for anything. We should naturally, if we're eating the food we're designed for, we're naturally healthy. Have you ever heard of the Grand Canyon? Have you ever been to the Grand Canyon? Anybody to the Grand Canyon? In, yeah, some of you have been there. Um, we were there a few years ago, and um, there's this, it's so funny, it's beautiful, it's this huge canyon, you know, and you look down and you see this gigantic canyon. At the very bottom of the canyon is the Colorado River, and there's signs everywhere. It's this beautiful view, but there's signs everywhere that say, danger, warning, never attempt to hike all the way down to the Colorado River and back up in one day. People die trying to do that. It's too far. Don't do it. So I said to Madeline, I'm going to try that. <laughs> and so the next day, I, I took off, and I went down this trail, and it's way, it's so far, it's like thousands of feet down. And, you know, I finally got to the, to the Colorado River, and there's a sign that says, no swimming. So I took a quick swim, <laughs> and I turned around, and I went back up. 
and I was back up on the rim again before noon for lunch. And she said, wow, how'd you do that so fast? I said, well, those signs are made for people who aren't vegan. I mean, if you're vegan, it's no big deal. I mean, if people that eat meat and dairy, they try to do that, they probably would die. They'd probably die right on the trail. But if you're eating the food you're designed for, it's no problem. Really. I mean, we have to wake up. All right. <laughs> So, I don't know. I have, okay, this is the last, probably the last question, then we'll, then we'll go to our, our workshop. Okay, yes? Uh, Dr. Tettel, thank you for your fine speech. I would like to, uh, to, to ask you a question. How do you counter the criticism expressed by many that veganism is, let's say, a form of luxury that can be... Uh, affected in the rich western part of the world. And as an example, I will, uh, I will bring the, the previous speech of Mr. Spector, who showed the statistics of vegan restaurants. And the most of them were in Europe, which is very rich, and the much, much less of them were in Africa, which is very poor. And then added the uh, sub-question, how do you criticize and what's your opinion on the sometimes violent activism by vegan groups against the people that work as butchers or, uh, or let's say, right. fishermen, etc. I'm, I'm saying that because the, 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 the respected conservative daily, Le Figaro in France, has in, in, in its Saturday issue a lot of articles uh, stating on this activism. I want to hear your opinion. Okay, so the question, there was a, kind of a two-part question. The second part was about, well, what do I say about the, um, the actions of vegan activists who are sometimes violent, they'll maybe attack uh, butcher shops and, and so forth. The first part of the question was about sort of elitism. El elitism, I guess, that, that being vegan is kind of elitist because it's, it's more expensive than eating uh, animal-based foods or something like that. So uh, those are big questions. I, I wish I had more time, but I, I don't want to talk too long. But basically, uh, the first question about the elitism, I mean, first of all, just understand that pr virtually every government in the world subsidizes the meat, dairy, and egg industry and causes those products to be much cheaper than they normally would be. In the United States, it's billions of dollars are, are given, so burgers would normally cost probably $25 or $30. So eating a plant-based diet is the, is the most non-elitist thing you can do. Our grandparents, I mean, I talk to people in Greece here, they say, when I say about veganism, they say, oh yeah, that's about how our grandparents ate, right? That's how they used to eat in the old days. They would eat mainly, maybe they'd have meat once a, a, a week because it was expensive, it was a luxury item. Um, but eating vegetables and grains and legumes and fruits and nuts and seeds, this is, uh, takes much less land, much less petroleum, it's much less expensive. It's much more egalitarian. It's much, it's much more what people, food people uh, can grow uh, themselves. So I'm, a, I'm really in favor of community-based agriculture, supporting you know, everyone, if you can, have your own garden or, or support local people, uh, growing gardens, organic, whole food, plant-based diet. Madeline and I have been, been vegans a long time. I think the stuff that Ken was talking about, all the you know, impossible burgers, beyond burgers, all this stuff, I mean, I would never eat that stuff. But I think in the beginning, when people are transitioning, they want to eat meat, then okay, they eat it for a while. But we should really make our diet, the foundation of our diet should be very inexpensive. I mean, it's not expensive to buy rice and potatoes and sweet potatoes and vegetables and grains and bread and noodles and pasta. It's, very, it's the least expensive food. It's the food we can, that everyone can eat. It's available for everyone. It's the most egalitarian, least, what's elitist is meat. What's the elitist is dairy and eggs. I mean, that's elitism. And I can go on and on forever about that, but that's the basic thing. And so our, our whole economic system um, should is skewed because the ranchers and, and fishermen and farmers get billions of dollars from governments and they're subsidized. And the healthcare industry is also subsidized. So that's that. And then as far as your good question, these are great questions. The question about attacking butchers or, or, or these kinds of things, I, I really, you know, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. The thing is, this is a whole other thing to talk about. I'll just say briefly, our life is an adventure. 
And wherever we are in our life is, is perfect where we should be right now. So whether you're a vegan or a vegetarian or a pre-vegan or pre-vegetarian or you're a long-time vegan, you know, wherever you are, that's great. You're there. So just remember, we're, our, our, the point is to make progress, to, to grow. And so I think a lot of people, when, they, when we first become vegans, we go through three stages. I talk about that. Okay, the first stage we go through is the beginning stage, right? We're a beginner vegan. That's a very bad time. It's very difficult, usually. We have to learn so much. We have to figure out how to make good you know, food. We have to know what to say to people when they say, oh, you're a vegan, that's stupid, because if everybody went vegan, cows would take over the earth. I mean, oh, I didn't think of that. Now what do I do? <laughs> so we have to understand, you know, the beginning stage is difficult. But then the second stage we come to is also very difficult. That's what I call the angry vegan stage. Now we're, we're, we understand how to make healthy meals, and we understand how to respond to people's questions, but now we're angry all the time because who's the, when you go to, on YouTube and you watch these undercover videos of the horrible abuse of animals on factory farms and slaughterhouses and fisheries and so forth, who's watching those videos? It's only vegans. You know, I mean, the people that are actually eating that stuff who should watch it, they're not going to watch it. They say, oh, I'm not going to watch that. I want to enjoy my bacon. So they're not watching. So then we get angry. You have to watch this. I'm going to shake you... At, until you stop eating that, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna slap you until you stop. I'm gonna, you know, we get very angry because we, because we feel for the animals. We think they don't care. We, we, it's natural to get angry with them. So I wrote the World Peace Diet partly for people who are stuck in stage two, in the angry vegan stage. We're either angry or we're depressed, or we're. Um, we're outraged, or some people avoid that whole thing by being closet vegans, where they, where they just say, I'm not going to talk about it. Are you a vegan? No. I, I, I mean, just, I, just let me eat my tofu and leave me alone. <laughs> you know, some people just don't even want to talk about it. But the good news is there's a third stage. I call it deep veganism. And I wrote the World Peace Diet to help all of us get to that point of deep veganism, which is where we now understand this bigger picture that I've been trying to share with you tonight. We understand the history of our culture. We understand that we're all born into a hurting society. We understand that we're all wounded, that we've been abused by well-meaning, loving people to eat meat and dairy, that that shut us, our hearts down. So even if we're vegans, we still are wounded. We still get angry. We still blame and criticize and shame and fight. And, and compete and say, well, we don't like those people. They're not vegans. And those are vegans, but they're the wrong kind of vegans. We don't like them either. And we don't like them. And we fight with each other. And we do all this, you know, it's, it's our woundedness. So I always say, how many people can we actually change? What do you think? How many people can I actually change? One. Yes, right. One. There's only one. I can change the one who is speaking these words, who is at, moving these hands, that's the one I can, if, if I try to change somebody else, I mean, if someone came at me and said, well, you know, I'm better than you, I know better than you, I'm going to change you, I'd be like, okay, try it. You know, I'd be fighting back. You know, but we vegans, we think we can do that. We, the basic thing is, I'm a vegan, I'm superior, you're not a vegan, you're inferior. So I'm right, you're wrong, I'm going to change you. People are going to fight back. I would too, right? Nobody wants to have that. So the whole idea is to realize I can only change myself. How do we get people to go vegan? This is the great irony the great irony, if we try to change other people, they resist, and we end up changing practically nobody. Or if we do change them when we're not, when we're not looking, they change back. <laughs> but if we just try to change ourselves, if we try to make ourselves the best possible vegan we can be, what is veganism? It's love, kindness, caring, mercy, tenderness, gentleness, freedom, creativity, abundance. It's love. If we try to be respectful and loving and kind in our relationships with non-human animals, in our relationships with human animals, then what we'll find is, all around us, people start going vegan. It just starts happening. And when our movement matures to the point where we are all really working on ourselves, and out of that, we're doing our activism. We're creating our marches. We're creating our, uh, our videos and our cooking classes. It's out of love and kindness and respect for animals and for other people. And we really feel that. And we work on our own relationships with our own husbands, wives, and mothers, and kids, and have those be in kindness and love and caring. We'll create a movement that will attract and will be completely unstoppable. This is the only way it's going to happen. We have to transform ourselves, transform our movement, so that it's congruent, so that what we're saying and how we're saying it is the same thing. And who we are when we say it is that. 
We have to make ourselves the message to live this at such a deep level that just our gestures, we just come into the room. I mean, when you're really good at this, you just walk into a room, you don't say anything, and everybody goes vegan. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a little joke. But I think, no, really, I think <laughs> the idea is, though, is that when we, when we embody this at a deep level, people feel it. And we can create a movement based on this. And I think it's happening. I mean, I, I think our movement is really maturing. And it's beautiful to see. So it's important to understand deep veganism and to, to try to live this as deeply as we can. So um, thank you for these great questions. It's really uh, an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, we have a couple of minutes. I'm happy to um, sign copies of our book, The Inner Islands, or the audio book. So we have some uh, music and meditation CDs. And then we'll go over to the other place in a few minutes, maybe 10 minutes, and do a short workshop and go a little deeper into these things. Thank you very much. Much love. Thank you.